Good morning and welcome. I greet you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as we gather together to worship uh, this morning. I suspect many are gone on Thanksgiving and some are home for Thanksgiving. So it's kind of a bit of a trade-off, mix and match. Uh, but we recognize it is that kind of, kind of weekend. Well, we are a praying people, so we begin our services as we always do, and that is with prayer. So take a moment, look around the room, look into your own life, uh, and take a moment to pray, and then I will pray with us and for us. Let's pray. Father, whether we're here or watching online or part of our family is gone to visit their families, we are truly grateful this morning as we gather in safety and warmth and well-being. We gather in a place set aside for your worship and your glory, a place of peace and rest in our often busy and sometimes tiring days. So in this place of peace, on this day set aside for rest, we give you thanks that all that we do may bring glory to your name, in Jesus' name. Draw your attention very briefly, not a lot of announcements. Tomorrow's Thanksgiving, as you well know. Is Ladies Bible Study done? Okay, so I'll remove that from the bulletin, but that's done. Club DG, are you on for this week? We continue on, and then uh, Bible Study at Swirly Shirley's. And then here we are doing uh, Yom Kippur this week as we move through. We did Rosh Hashanah, New Year's on Wednesday, and we continue on. Youth group, I know Dales aren't here, but I have a feeling that continues. And then this Saturday is the big day. Our two bastards men's conference at the Hangar starting at 9 a.m. And we've got about 40 other people registered plus locals, so we're looking for about 75 men uh, coming and going. And uh, we had our one speaker back out at the last minute, but God is gracious and brought somebody else in. So it's been quite a How was practice on Friday? Very good. You're ready to go. So uh, if you're not joining us, I encourage you and thank you to pray for us on that day. This is our first ever, and uh, we've got a good team put together, but we sure could use your prayers. <laughs> And then ongoing, you'll see a few things there. So am I missing anything that we all need to be aware of? Dylan, Joni. Oh, Dylan, Joni, yes, you have something. Oh, the shoe box. The shoe boxes. <laughs> Do we have a video? No. No, we don't have a video. Joni, just want to, one of you two want to say what's happening? Or do you want me to? Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. The boxes are out. I'm waiting for the brochures to come. Yeah. They should be here for this coming Sunday, but if you want to start filling boxes, you can. And collection week is when? Collection week is November 5th, somewhere into 20. So you go Something. three or four weeks yet. So yeah. Operation Christmas Child begins. I know it feels like it always catches us off guard every year, uh, but it is beginning and the materials are there, just the brochures are on the way. So uh, if you don't know what Operation Christmas Child is, I'm sure we'll make connections in the weeks to come. Uh, for those of you who do know and have participated, uh, material is there available for you. All right, T. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church on this beautiful Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, we have so much to be thankful for in our town and in our families and in our country, and, and uh, God has really blessed us. Uh, we want to recognize a few people had some birthdays this week. Uh, Elizabeth Jeffries had a birthday, and the Super Twins, Doug and Deanna Newfeld had a birthday on <laughs> Friday, so, um, and if I've missed anybody, I'm sorry. Oh, Winston had a birthday too, thank you. So let's stand together and sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you.
519. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving weekend, as we hopefully had get to the opportunity to get together and uh, eat with family and friends, or uh, just go to Scotts and get a burger. I'm not sure what your path is, but uh, a time of celebration as well. That's great. Father, in this world, there are struggles. We think of what's happening down in Florida and the south, and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and all that kind of stuff that's happening there. We think about the unrest in the Middle East and the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and all the conflicts that we don't hear about in the news that are still happening. And there are times we look and we wonder, will there ever be peace on earth? We recognize that until that day, we come and we rest in your sovereignty over all things, that you are working all things towards your glorious end, to the return of your Son, who shall have dominion, and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to your glory. Until that day, give us peace, I pray. We think about friends and family in hospital who have long days ahead of them. I think particularly of Peter today, as he uh, faces the challenges he does, that you would strengthen him and give uh, his doctors wisdom in getting the situation under control. For those with new little ones and those with soon to have new little ones, that you would give them a measure of strength and grace in this day. And all of us, for the work we have, the work we can do, the resources we've been given, the beauty and the serenity of the land that we live in. We are truly, truly grateful for your hand upon us. And we give thanks in all these things with a grateful heart to you, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll ask our ushers to come forward.
you may be seated and we will watch that. This is thankful. The thankful leper. This is Jesus. Hey -o! Who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus did many amazing things while he was on earth. It's true. One day, he was traveling to Jerusalem and was going through a village when ten men who had leprosy came to him. Now, in the time Jesus lived, leprosy was a terrible sickness that could be caught very easily. Because of this, people with leprosy were sent outside of the places that they lived. They were called unclean, and no one wanted to be close to them. Ah, gross! But when these men who had leprosy saw Jesus coming, hey, Jesus! they called out to him and said, Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus saw them and said, go show yourself to the priests. Oh, yeah, we knew that. And as they went, they were healed and had leprosy no more. When one of the men saw that he was healed, he came back to Jesus shouting, Praise God! Oh yeah, praise God! He thanked Jesus for what he had done. Aww. Hmm. Jesus asked, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this Samaritan? Looks like it. Then Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Thank you. And so the man was healed because he had faith and he was thankful for what Jesus had done for him. Our scripture reading today is taken from Philippians chapter 1, and we'll be reading verses 1 to 11. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. And I'd like to ask you to stand up, please, as we read God's word. Beginning at verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with the joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Is it, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how, long, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Please be seated. I don't think we actually oh, have. They have clipboards today, so I think they're good. <laughs> Do I get a clipboard? You, you know, Dylan, I can be hot. Well, um, Dan doesn't know why we're here, and neither do you, so I'll let you all know. Um, this month and this Sunday, to add to the confusion, is Pastor Appreciation Month Day. Does that make sense? <laughs> Clear as mud. October's Pastor Appreciation Month. I did not know that. But, uh, I was informed as well. Oh, that's good to know. And that's why we're here. Okay. So we just have a small token of our appreciation on behalf of the board and, and everybody for you. And we know that no man is an island. And we know that Donna is shipwrecked with you. <laughs> and so it is not just thank you, but thank you and Donna for, for your leadership in this place. Um, we know that uh, you do a lot of work behind the scenes on our behalf and a lot of things go unnoticed and so we're grateful for that. We thank you for that. We know that you uh, have a great servant heart 
and you, know, you seek to serve here, and that is it is seen and appreciated. And so we thank you for that. In the nick of time, well, it's about time. Sometimes I'm ahead of time, and sometimes we kill time. A stitch in time, somehow it saves nine. Time flies, but it also crawls. You ever had the time of your life? Man, that was good timing. And those were bad times. And timing, timing is everything. And Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. We're only going to look at two verses this morning, but it's about time. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now after John was taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. In Mark's gospel, time plays a critical role. He mentions it 23 times, but the time will come. This lasts only a short time. Finally, the opportune time came, but this time it was late in the day, be on guard, be alert. You don't know when that time will come. In Mark's Gospel, time moves quickly, as a wise man once told me, that time is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer to the end, the faster it goes. I think there's wisdom there. And in this one sentence here in Mark, it's all one sentence, he makes three proclamations that are loaded with ideas. They're like, they're like hyperlinks when you, uh, on a web page, you click it opens up another tab. So this morning, we're gonna look at those three simple little statements that open up big tabs. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe. There's a lot here, but we don't have a lot of time. The first proclamation is loaded beyond imagination. That is, the time is fulfilled. This is an echo of Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, unto the law. For this to happen, in other words, when Jesus came, the time was perfect. Everything coincided, pulled together like, like three marks, three arrows pointing to a single moment. And for this time to be particular, three conditions had to be met. First, there had to be a spiritual condition fulfilled, a cultural condition understood, and a social condition enforced. Let's take a look at these three. The first is the spiritual condition. And that was, at the time of Jesus, the Jewish culture was dominated by the law, by the temple and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. And the law governed all their behavior. It's interesting, as we do Wednesday Bible study and going through uh, the holidays, we see how the law continues to this day, affecting holidays. We are right now in the 10 days between New Year's and Yom Kippur. These are called the days of awe, and they are a time of repentance. And so the law governs all behavior. This was the spiritual world and mindset that Jesus came into. There were truths that people had known and understood about who God was and who they were and how that relationship worked. There were realities laid down. And one of the realities was the spiritual condition for the coming of the Messiah. They had to know how it all fit in God's divine plan. They had to know that the world needed this Savior, the Messiah. And so the law came convincing people both of his coming, but also of his necessity. They had to know that he would be there, but also why he had to be there. And of course, the answer is they couldn't keep the law. So John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This idea of sin had to be ingrained into the spiritual fabric of the culture. And so the law came, 613 laws, 365 do-nots, one for every day of the year, and 248 do's. That's a lot of laws. 
And there it provided a standard of what it meant to be right, to reveal the spiritual bankrupt condition of the people. Galatians 3, 24, 25 says, Therefore the law has come as a tutor to lead us to Christ, knowing but now faith has come, we're no longer under the tutor. So the law existed to prepare the spiritual mindset of Israel. This spiritual lineage had to be in place. We needed these ideas of prophet, priest, and king, and all this fabric had to be woven. He had to be born of the house of David. And so we see in Jesus' lifetime, he fulfills over 300 prophecies regarding the Messiah. This spiritual condition had to occur to lay the foundation for the next two. So we see Jesus being born into the spiritual condition that he needed to be, and the people in the condition they needed to be. He fulfills the prophetic. He brings people face to face with their failure to keep this law. See, that language, however, needed a framework. It wasn't enough for a relationship to be carried into the soul. It needed words and music and ideas and culture to carry it, to say that Jesus was the spotless lamb. Well, if you don't know what a lamb is, it's awful hard to communicate an idea. So you need a cultural language. The gospel needed a cultural vessel in which it could be carried and communicated. It wasn't enough to have the water of life. The water needed a vessel to be carried. The door to heaven needed a frame. And the light needed a lampstand. So we begin, there was a spiritual foundation, Judaism, which provided the structure of the Messiah as idea, and the law provided the structure of the need for such Messiah, and then along came the cultural condition. About 300 years before Jesus was born, a man named Alexander took it upon himself to conquer the world. And so from Greece to Egypt to Northwest India and Pakistan, he went undefeated. But along with his armies, Alexander the Great, he brought painters and artists and musicians and philosophers and architects and mathematicians and scientists. He established 20 Greek cities everywhere he went so that Greek culture and language and thought would prevail across the known world. And so businesses began to speak a common language called koine, the common language that crossed borders. So wherever you were within his empire, you spoke the same language. This created a cultural fabric that everyone understood. This force was called Hellenization. And through it, the world began to speak, but also to think alike. They enjoyed the same music, the same art, the same theater. They began to have a collective cultural framework. We talk about what it means to be a Canadian and trying to establish some kind of collective cultural framework so that we all speak the same thoughts. The fruit of this was the Jews created a new kind of version of the Old Testament, translated into Greek so that everyone could read it. The temple was now finally repaired and restored under the wealth of the kings. Civil war broke out and conservative forces won. And Herod the Great came from that. And under this period, a group of people called the Pharisees came into existence. They were the conservative element. So beyond this, Hellenization had an impact on the way the Western world thought about science and philosophy and God himself. It gave birth to the idea of the word that John would capture, the living word that John would proclaim. So the Jews now had a temple, a, a new Bible written in Greek. They had a different way of looking at life that blended both Greek and Hebrew ideas. A, a new class of spiritual leaders, the Pharisees, who would be instrumental in Jesus' mission. But this was not enough yet. For we had a new soul, a, a Hebrew soul. We had a new mind, a, a Greek mind, but there's still the practical world around us. The gospel has to be carried on real roads by real people. Faith had a language in which it could be communicated and cultural currents which it was carried along, but it needed roads to walk on. And a world full of pirates and bandits and petty kings and walled cities would stop the spread of the gospel and prohibit it from ever going anywhere. And so for this, we need the Romans. Fascinating. Um, the Washington Post and the Globe and Mail did research recently about how many times men think about Rome. And you know what? On average, at least once a month, men think about the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, some men think about the Roman Empire several times a day. We don't know why. 
but it's a weird current phenomenon. I'm not sure we won't do a survey of how many you think about the Roman Empire, but apparently it's this new thing, or old thing. So we needed a physical universe to carry these ideas and this spiritual reality, and that's Rome. So in 63 BC, Pompey the Great occupied Jerusalem, making it a Roman vassal state. Judea was now part of the empire. And Herod may have been on the throne, but he owed that throne to his loyalty to Rome. It was Rome who gave Herod his throne, hit his armies to control it, and the Cyprus copper mines that paid for it all. So with the wealth and power that he possessed now, thanks to the stability and the prosperity of the Roman economy, Herod rebuilt the temple. And this would play a role in Jesus' life. Do you see how the pieces start to... The Messiah needs a temple. The Greeks think about temples, and the Romans, well, they provide the money to build temples. And so Rome changed the world. Roman law governed how everyone would be treated. Uh, Roman legions ensured that there was peace throughout the land. Roman navies ensured safe travel across the Mediterranean. It was so secure that the Mediterranean was called Rome's bathtub, their little playground. And so it was under Roman law that Jesus was tried and executed. It was under Roman rule that Paul's citizenship became important and allowed him to live in the face of threats against his life. And it was under Roman protection that Roman missionaries would travel the Western world on Roman roads and Roman ships to the far corners of the Roman Empire. And it was within Roman society that then Paul crafted the language of the empire and his messages. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. He says, I'm a slave of righteousness. He says, we're adopted into a family. Put on the full armor of God. And in 2 Corinthians 4, he uses the language of the gladiators. I am pressured, but I'm never cornered. I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. He pulls in the language of combat to proclaim the message. So sin is battled and conquered, and we take thoughts captive, just like the Romans did. Even the mark of the beast finds its origin in Roman tradition. The Roman legionnaires would brand upon their arms the name of their legion, their rank, and where they belonged, and they would carry with them everywhere they went that they belonged to Rome. So these images are all contained within the empire. So we have this coming together of these three forces. A time is fulfilled. Jewish prophetic spiritual realities, Greek philosophic thoughts, and Roman roads. This paved the way for Jesus. Let me give you one illustration how beautifully this all worked together. And that is the crucifixion. If Rome had not been there, Jesus would not have been crucified. He would have been stoned. But if he was Roman, he would have not been crucified. He would have been beheaded, so he had to be outside of Rome. He wouldn't have been on, put on trial if it weren't for the Pharisees, and the Pharisees wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for Alexander the Great. You see how it all kind of works together remarkably? So we need Judaism to have a reason for the crucifixion. Judaism gave us a lamb to execute. We needed Roman laws or methods in order to get the job done. The Romans gave us the means of execution. And we need Greek Pharisees for the trial to occur in the first place. The Pharisees gave us the motive for the execution. Judaism gave us the law, the Romans gave us the means, and the Pharisees gave us the motive. None of this could have occurred unless all three existed in this little moment of time. And boy howdy, it was a little moment of time. The whole thing had to occur between 27 BC and 70 AD in that little 97 year window. Before it, it couldn't have occurred and after it, it couldn't have occurred. You see, in 27 AD, Augustus declared the peace of Rome, Pax Romana. He established Roman dominance over the Mediterranean. So it had to occur after that. But before 70, because in 70 AD, Jerusalem fell to the Romans and was destroyed. There was a 103 year window, that's it. Jesus could not have come before or after into this little window of time, a hundred years. Jews, Greeks, and Romans, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. That all leads us now to our second proclamation. The time is fulfilled. The time is now, this new time. The kingdom has arrived. And there is a subject for discussion. The kingdom is at hand. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is God's reign. It is a both present reality 
and a free future event. It is described in the life of Jesus and lived through his message back and forth. It is the subject of his parables, 43 parables, 13 are about the kingdom. It's the central theme of his spoken message in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all this will be added to you. Broadly, the kingdom of God is the eternal rule and reign of the sovereign God over all the universe. Narrowly, it's the rule and reign of God over your universe as we submit to his authority. The kingdom was the central message in the reality of Jesus. I looked on Amazon. There are 20,000 books on Amazon about the kingdom of God. That's a pretty broad subject. We don't have time. 66 times in the New Testament it's actually used. Isaiah 11, 9 says, They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the kingdom of God, the earth full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. So the second proclamation is the kingdom, the reign, the rule of God, both in the hearts and in the minds and in the sovereign universe itself, which leads us to the third proclamation. That is, how do you enter the kingdom? Well, how do you get into a kingdom? How, how do you join the club? Whether it's, it's either too cold or too hot in here, I haven't decided yet. How do you get into it? The Greek kingdom was brought about by Alexander's brilliance. The Roman Empire was brought about by Caesar's brutality. So they knew how about kingdoms. You entered into citizenship, the Roman process was complex. And so they understood kingdoms. But Jesus says, my kingdom is a little different. He said, this kingdom has entered, repent and believe. Repent and believe. That's how you get into the kingdom. Now, it sounds like two commands, but it's actually one. If I said, leave Calgary and go to Winnipeg, that's not two commands, because you can't go until you leave, and if you leave, you can, you're free to go, right? It's impossible to go to Winnipeg without leaving Calgary. So, repent and believe are the same command, just two sides of it. In order to believe, you must repent, and if you repent, you have to turn and believe. Time is too short to really go through all the packaging of repentance. But let me unpack it in two ways. First, repentance is a specific act about a specific event. Uh, Satan will try and give you a sense of vague generalities, but it's, you did this on this date, and that's the work of the Spirit convicting us of sin and righteousness and judgment, and so we turn for that and say, okay, I am not going to do that anymore. That's pretty specific, and that is kind of what we're familiar with. But as we go through repentance in Scripture, it also presents a broader image, and this is where it comes in here. That repentance is a broader and deeper idea. It is the change of direction of our entire lives, a new focus of all that we are. Individual repentance is like those little corrections you make when you drive down the highway, you know, and you, you go around the pothole, or maybe you aim towards the gopher, I'm not sure how you drive. But these specific little corrections on the journey. The broader sense of repentance is the movement towards the end result. We're going to Medicine Hat. We have that in mind. And so everything in the vehicle, all our actions and everything, directs us and leads us towards that. But as we go, we make little corrections to get us there safely. We turn at the corner. Do you sense the difference? They are individual choices about a specific hazard. That's the little ones. Essential for making it to the direction but they're small in regards to the entire journey. Repentance in the broadest term is a reflection of a new intention of your life. And this is the best way I can illustrate it. This comes from living in Winnipeg six years. I always say I did six years of provincial time in Winnipeg. <laughs> I want you to imagine this morning that all your life you love Winnipeg. You are a slave to your love for Winnipeg. You know the song and you've got the motto memorized. Does anybody know what the motto of the city of Winnipeg is? Not enough Winnipeg fans here. Made from what's real. Eh, I guess that works. It's no better than Swift Currents where life makes sense. Someone once said that Winnipeg is full of dreamers because they spend half their lives dreaming about how they can leave Winnipeg. But not you. You focus your energies and direction. You love Winnipeg. You dream about Old Kildonan and St. James. You save up your money so you can go to the Museum of Human Rights, the Leo Mole Sculpture Garden, and the McPhillip Station Casino. You just love Winnipeg. You own a Winnipeg Sea Bears jersey. 
You know the name of the quarterback of the Manitoba Fearless football team, which none of you do, right? Okay. But then in a moment, something happens. You have a crisis, a transition, and your heart changes. And you realize that the Jets and the Titanic both look great until they get on the ice. That joke, by the way, you're allowed to. Yeah, grow. But now you turn and you see Saskatchewan. Several years ago at district conference, we had a debate of Manitoba versus Saskatchewan. I represented Saskatchewan and we won. Because <laughs> you realize that even Burton Cummings had common sense enough to move to Moose Jaw. That Johnny Cash knew a girl in Saskatoon. That Manitoba had Canada's only civil war and general strike. That Saskatchewan is 6% larger than Manitoba. Our inflation rate is lower, our population is growing at nearly twice the rate, our sales tax is lower, our average, average wages are higher, and our income tax is lower. Not bad. Now the trajectory of your life changes. You get rid of some things, your fearless football jersey goes in the garbage. You realize that the Winnipeg Comedy Festival really wasn't that funny. And your attitude about Winnipeg changes because you see a better future in Saskatchewan. That's repentance. One point you are moving and all of your life, your interests, your hobbies, your activities, you just have this broad perspective about where you're going like, and you make this crisis change. And when the little things change, you realize that your attitude and your understanding and your focus is really what has changed. And as you move toward the big, you make little corrections along the way. That's those little repents. Okay, Lord, you convicted me about this. I need to stop doing that. Okay, I get it. But it's really just a little thing on a part of a bigger and broader perspective. This is the big picture of repentance. Winnipeg stops being your treasure. And you no longer believe that Winnipeg is the <coughs> answer. But store up yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and thieves don't break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we recognize that repentance in part is about the little things. We know the value and the importance of little things. And it's easy to get lost in the little details and to guilt ourselves that we didn't do the right thing or kept losing ground on one soft spot in our lives. And I don't want to minimize the value and the importance of those little spots. We all know that small steps make a difference. When you Stack all the tiny successes together, you get a big success. We know that eagles fly one downbeat at a time. And so I don't want to minimize that, but this morning I want you to revisualize what repentance really means, or in adding to it. That we look at the trajectory of our lives and say, which direction am I headed? Where is my heart being pulled? Where am I directing my energies and my resources towards? Repentance is about the horizon on which you're traveling to. And all those little pieces work together to guide you in that direction. You see, God did that. He took all the little pieces and he guided them in a broad direction towards the ultimate fulfillment of his plan. He worked through hundreds of years of specific people, events, and purposes to guide Israel to a spot where they knew about the Messiah. He molded a young man named Alexander III, tutored by Aristotle, who at the age of 16 saved his father's life and began to lead armies into battle, 16 years old. He forged the great empire of Rome so that her laws were forged in iron and her punishments hewn in blood. He orchestrated all the details. Why? Because the trajectory of history was moving toward the fulfillment of his purpose, and he's doing the same thing today. We look at our world and go, what is going on? We get a little myopic, a little focused on the little things that we realize that all things are coming into fruition for God's ultimate fulfillment of his purpose of the returning of his son. And the same thing in our lives. Those little moments that he's working at, changing your heart here, changing your heart there, that direction, that attitude, that mindset, that focus, that energy is all being guided for his ultimate purpose in your life. So that you and I might become like Jesus. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus. And I'll be honest, I don't understand always the little details. I wish we could fly higher and soar greater and look down at our lives and say, this is how it all came to be. Who knows? Don and I met because we loved National Geographic. 
That's how it began, in a library, looking at National Geographic. Here we are 45 years later. It all began in the littlest of ways. William Cowper put it this way, and I want to end with this. I hope you see the big picture of God at work, not only in your life, but in our world. Cowper was a bit of a madman, had serious mental health issues, was institutionalized many times, his fiance refused to bury him. He had a madness, but in that madness he saw beauty. And he wrote this. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and he rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and he works his sovereign will. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you see with so much dread are big with mercy and shall break and the blessing on your head. Judge not the Lord by your feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purpose will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief, it's sure to err, and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. You probably know the first line. God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. But Cowper reminds us, deep, I love that image, unfathomable minds of never failing skill. He treasures up bright designs like diamonds he mines. We don't always know what's going on in our lives. And we don't always know what's going on in our world. But God is at work accomplishing his will, making us like Jesus. And someday, every knee will bow and every tongue can. Father, I don't know the details of everyone's life, but you do. And in your infinite and sometimes unfathomable ways, you are shaping and crafting the direction of our lives as we submit and surrender to them. Father, I do pray if there are specific items in our lives that we need to redirect, those little calls, or maybe it's a big call to repentance, but the overarching direction of our lives would be towards your kingdom. Let us see the beauty of your treasures and live our lives according. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Donna. Join us as we sing our closing hymn. We will be singing the doxology together. Please stand with us. bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ through his vicarious death upon the cross for all your sins. God bless. I invite you to join us for coffee and just a reminder, let's keep the food in the hall, not in the basement. <laughs> Button, the right button with the dog. The red one. That one. Yep. <laughs>